So here, this depicts uh, the normal bone density at zero and um, what's considered osteopenia as one standard deviation away from the peak bone density and osteoporosis as a negative 2.5, so 2.5 standard deviations away from peak bone density. So there was an article in the New York uh, Times in 2003 where a top osteoporotic researcher, Dr. Richard Cummings, stated that there's no basis to, to uh, indicate that one standard deviation away from bone density is a condition that half the population needs to worry about. The article went further into saying that the drug companies were behind putting uh, some screening tools in, a lot of screening tools in the doctor's offices and uh, encouraging doctors to treat with drugs um, even if it was just osteopenia. So it's very kind of an interesting theory and I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I mean, if you were a, a drug marketing person, you would think, hmm, how can I sell more drugs? Let me, let's create this, let's encourage doctors to, to treat even just osteopenia. I think it's a good idea to educate the public. I think it's a good idea to, uh, to educate doctors to screen. Um, but um, I don't think, unless ex there's extenuating circumstances, that osteopenia should be treated with drugs. <clears throat> what about drugs? So here are some of the medications that, or all of the pretty much all the medications that are used for osteoporosis. And the bisphosphonates are the most, we're the most familiar with those. Um, they include Fosamax, Actinel, Boniva, and Reclast. So they work on the osteoclast. Remember the osteoclast is the digester. So they work by preventing the osteoclast from eating up bone, so it increases the density of the bone. Um, Reclast is a once a year um, injection of a biphosphonate. Um, also hormones such as estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone increase bone density and this is why it's more common in women in menopause because all these hormones drop to, low, to lower levels and so that is when osteoporosis occurs in women. Myocalcin is a salmon calcitonin. So calcitonin is produced in your parathyroid gland, and you can think of it as calcium in. So it, it encourages calcium to go into the bone, so it builds bone. And so the myocalcin is actually from salmon calcitonin. Forteo is a para parathyroid hormone. That's also a hormone that's in your parathyroid gland, and that also has to do with, um, with bone, bone density. There's also selective estrogen receptor modulators, which are SERMs. They're similar to, um, to estrogens. They bind to estrogen receptors, but they don't have the side effects of estrogen. And then the latest is the monoclonal antibody called Prolia. This is a every six month injection, uh, and this also works on the osteoclasts. What are the risks of these medications? Now, if you're on these medications, please don't pull yourself off them. So these risks are, are rare, but they do occur. But just talk to your doctor before you make any decisions about it. So the biphosphonates, they're notoriously uh, cause uh, esophageal irritation. They can cause ulcerations and cancer, esophageal cancer. And because they work on the osteoclast, the bone becomes, can become brittle and there is a risk of a femur fracture, femoral fracture. It can also cause osteonecrosis of the jaw, that's dead bone in the jaw, and this is usually with dental surgery on patients that are on biphosphonates, um, and they can cause muscle and joint pains. Myocalcin uh, has an increased risk of a number of different cancers. As a matter of fact, in March of 2013, the FDA uh, put out a statement that they recommend a shorter course of, of myocalcin, um, I think no more than two years because of this risk of increased cancers. Forteo is the parathyroid. It works on the osteoblast. So remember that immature cell, osteoblast? So it can cause an osteoblastoma, which is a type of bone cancer. Prolia also works on the osteoclast, and it can cause so it can cause femoral fractures. It also decreases uh, causes immunosuppression, so you're more likely to develop 
some infections, like endocarditis is, is one of, uh, has been reported. And reclast is, uh, can exacerbate an arrhythmia called uh, atrial fibrillation. So what about natural treatments? First of all, <clears throat> I love this slide. This was taken from uh, Yoga for Osteoporosis by Dr. Lauren Fishman. And um, he, let me introduce to you Julius Wolf. So Julius Wolf was a 19th century anatomist and surgeon. And he theorized that the load on a bone will not only increase the density, but it also changes the shape of the bone and also vice versa. So we do know that astronauts that go into space are become osteopenic and um, they really have to work at keeping their bone density. They are on bikes and they're doing weightlifting in space because of there's no gravity and so their bones become weak. So here's a normal femur at birth and here's a normal femur, the second one, normal femur at three years of age and a normal femur at five years of age. So you see how the bone is changing in relation to the walking and the force on the bone. And here is a paraplegic femur at five years of age. So it looks similar to the, the birth femur because there's no load on the bone, okay? So this is, I think, I think this is a great demonstration here. Now, Lauren, uh, Dr. Lauren Fishman did a two-year pilot study, and it was a small study where he um, gave his subjects 10 yoga poses a day to do and held, holding them for um, about 30, 45 minutes a piece. And he was able to show that there was uh, an improvement almost by one T-score on the hip and more than a half of a T-score on, um, on the spine by doing 10 poses a day, okay? He has an ongoing study, and if anybody's interested, I can give you the information. Several of my patients have entered the study. So, <laughs> how does this work? I love this slide. <laughs> this is a great, uh, this is not an easy pose. This is an arm balance. It's called crow pose, and um, she's doing a great job. So how this works is that with the compressive force and the tensile force where the, so your muscles are attached to tendons that are attached to bone. So with that tensile force from the muscle and the tendon pulling on the bone, that stimulates those osteocytes. And the compression stimulates the osteocytes. So for example, she is causing com the compression in the forearm and her wrists. She's also, utilizing a lot of the shoulder girdle muscles and therefore those bones that are attached or those muscles that are attached to those bones are being stimulated. So her, based on this pose, her arms are probably in really good shape. <laughs> what about food? Is this food? Ah, much better, much better. Lots of fruits and vegetables, different colors. So when we, when we breathe, when we use our muscles, and when we eat, we produce acid. This acid needs to be neutralized, and the body has the ability to neutralize acid. But if our diet is poor and we produce more acid, what happens is that calcium is leached from the bone to neutralize the acid. So a poor diet actually can cause osteoporosis. So here's some tips for alkali alkalizing. That's the opposite of acid. So alkalizing your body. Eat more fruits and vegetables. So fruits and vegetables are very alkaline, and you really want to aim for nine to 10 servings a day to counteract any acid that's produced in your body, okay? Reduce or eliminate sodas. So sodas, whether they be uh, Regular sodas or diet sodas, they have phosphoric acid, which is very acidic, and it leaches calcium from the bone. So I would guess get rid of the sodas. So refined carbohydrates and bleached flours and those types of things are very, and sugars are very high in acid. So substituting refined carbs with roots and gourds like sweet potatoes, yams, beets, parsnips, carrots, and squash 
will help alkalize um, the body. Adding fresh lemon and lime. We think of lemon and lime as acidic, but in the body it's alkaline. So just squeezing some lemon and lime onto your food will help. Adding sea vegetables like seaweed, alkaline. Drinking uh, high mineral spring water. So the mineral waters have calcium and magnesium and uh, potassium in them. So our tap water, you know, it's fluorinated <coughs> and chlorinated and not a lot of minerals in there. So mineral water is very good. Also, animal proteins have, tend to be very acidic. So limiting our animal protein to no more than 40 grams per day and substituting other types of proteins like soy, beans, and lentils is, is uh, good for alkalizing. And adding herbs and spices like cinnamon, ginger, and other herbs help to al alkalize the body. Here are some of the vitamins that are involved in, um, in bone densities, in increasing the bone density. So vitamin D, uh, we each can check vitamin D. We do a 25-hydroxy vitamin D level. And I like to recommend to keep it between 40 and 80. So around here, because of where we live, the sun, basically we need sunshine to, for our skin to convert to vitamin D. Uh, and the sun is just not that strong. So almost every one of my patients has vitamin D deficiency. So very important to get your vitamin D level checked. Um, vitamin C, A, B6, folic acid, B12, and K are all involved in, in mineralizing um, your bones. So a good multivitamin is important. In addition, minerals, uh, these are the minerals that are involved in um, in bone health. Calcium, we want uh, 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium per day. Now, you can get a lot of that in diet, and most people do not need more than 500 milligrams as a supplement. I would not supplement. You don't want to supplement the entire amount because that increases your risk of kidney stones, and recently there was a study about heart disease increased risk with too, min too much calcium supplementation. Uh, magnesium, I find a lot of people are very deficient in magnesium, so it's not it's a good idea to supplement with that. The other ones can be found, some of the trace uh, minerals can be found in, in f foods and in a multivitamin. Now strontium is an interesting one. So strontium is a mineral that actually helps the body, uh, the, the bones absorb calcium, and it in itself acts like calcium. So it can increase your bone density. Um, so we're excited because there's actually a, a supplement that we may get, we'll probably get in our office. It's made from algae calcium. So most, most of the calcium supplements are from limestone, but the algae calcium tends, is apparently a better calcium, um, better absorbed and better for bone health. So there's a supplement that has algae calcium, it has vitamin D, and strontium and vitamin K. So it's like a super, super um, supplement. And it's a, an excellent um, alternative to drugs for osteopenia and osteoporosis.